we were looking at um, the material selection and uh, we looked at uh, three typical uh, metallic alloys which are used in the aerospace sector and then we went on to composites and um, we said that yes there are advantages first of all we looked at that uh, list of um, the specific properties uh, that we had derived based on uh, strength stiffness and stability and then we compared that um, across different uh, metals that we had looked at as well as uh, <coughs> some typical uh, aerospace level composites now um, we said that there are also many other reasons other than these three that uh, the composite is uh, used and uh, before we get on to those advantages we also wanted to say that yes uh, like any other material this also has certain disadvantages we can't be blind to that so we should be aware of that and we saw many of these uh, in the previous class already and we saw how uh, we could probably um, work in spite of these uh, through certain ingenious uh, workarounds uh, both in terms of the actual fabrication um, as well as the testing and the modeling aspects as well now um, one of the things that uh, beginners are really concerned about is the fact that there is a uh, very poor transverse uh, uh, performance both in terms of strength and uh, the stiffness so uh, to just to give you uh, what kind of a drop that could be there if you take up uh, three typical composites uh, two of them are polymer uh, matrix composites the other one is a metal matrix composite uh, the middle one which is uh, having these triangles um, in all of them you are just plotting the non dimensional value of the uh, young's modulus along the structural direction as you change the fiber angle with that structural direction so let's say this is the structure so this is along the x the length of the structure this is the width um, so it, let's call it x1 x2 and x3 now uh, with respect to x1 what is the angle that the fiber makes if it makes um, an, an angle 0 degrees we say that's then unidirectional in all cases it's unidirectional because you're just considering a single layer but it's unidirectional with the um, principal material direction parallel to the uh, direction of the uh, structures uh, structural axis so that's when you have uh, this theta equal to 0 degrees the other extreme is when it goes to 90 degrees and then of course um, any other angle is can be uh, uh, it's not um, independent so you can see whatever you get out of the range 0 to 90 degrees can be obtained for the entire remaining 90 to 3 360 degrees because for example 180 becomes same as zero, and similarly 360 also becomes same as 0 etc so we just plot between 0 to 90 we see that you are not trying to compare these three materials with each other but for the given material we are trying to uh, put its uh, transverse modulus that is the modulus which is perpendicular to the uh, fiber direction that with respect to that modulus what is the factor so obviously because we are uh, non dimensionalizing with respect to e2 all of them should come to one when you go to 90 degrees that is very clear the question is what happens when um, you go to the um, you know, to the zero degrees which is what we would ideally like it to be because we would like to design the structure such that you put all the fibers along the dominant loading direction so you would essentially be trying to reap the benefits of that uh, fiber stiffness and that is what uh, you would try to look at because if you look at um, uh, maybe not in this case but uh, in the case which is typical because carbon epoxy is one of the leading uh, applications in aerospace the uh, drop is pretty steep it's understood that it will all drop but the drop is so steep that once you go to about to, uh, um, 20 degrees it's come to about uh, half of it 14 to 7 so that's essentially what you're looking at so it's a fairly steep drop it's not it's quite sensitive to the theta that's what um, you need to understand over there but the fact is that um, anywhere between 50 to 90 you see that it's pretty much almost same as the et in all all the three cases so essentially et for that particular uh, composite that you are looking at uh, whether it's metal matrix or whatever so uh, what typically happens is that you are designing the structure based on the ex values because that is what has been attractive to you and in fact when we are comparing the uh, stiffness based uh, uh, specific properties the square root of e by rho we were using this particular e ex we were not using any uh, sorry e1 
so which is essentially your longitudinal direction, what we call as EL also. Uh, so E1 is called as uh, EL sometimes, E subscript L, because it's along the longitudinal direction, and E2 is uh, many times referred to as E subscript big T, which is the transverse direction. Now, um, and so this would be EX by ET, that's essentially what you're looking at. So, since you have designed based on this and any small change, um, either because of the load uh, being off design or because during the manufacturing process there has been a slight change, um, because remember that you are actually, um, we will not go into the details of the manufacturing process. There are many, many different ways of doing it. But one typical way which is used in the aerospace um, composite fabrication is to use the autoclave process. So where you have uh, uh, put a wet prepreg, you design it in a particular way, the laminate, you put it inside the autoclave and make it go through certain temperature and pressure cycles. And um, during the temperature pressure cycles, it's typically in a vacuum bag as well. So the temperature and pressure cycles, there is a possibility there could be a small change that is happening because of the pressures and temperatures because the pressure is essentially a mechanical load and temperature change or a large temperature is essentially a thermal uh, stress which is occurring. So uh, during the fabrication process itself, it's undergoing during that cycle of he heating and cooling to pressurizing and depressurizing, it's going through a certain cycle and um, the process modeling that's why it has taken a lot of importance today. Uh, in particular, this happens a lot in uh, tires. As you know, most uh, tires, or whether you're talking of the aircraft tire uh, in the landing gear or even automobile tires, be it uh, bike or um, uh, any truck or whatever, you know that these are composites these days. It's not just rubber, there are fiber reinforcements these days. So typically have uh, steel reinforcements and or uh, nylon reinforcements. So many and depending on the kind of uh, loads it is expected to sustain, you typically have those. And so uh, during the theoretical or computational design process, you arrive at a certain uh, optimal angle in the different layers of that and you just try to uh, put that in the wet rubber, uh, raw rubber, and then uh, of course with all its additives and whatever, and then you try to cure this. When you're trying to cure this, there's a huge change in that because typically the rubber gives way much more easily than, uh, for example, many other matrices would. But even uh, the typical uh, epoxy matrix that we do, it's in a wet stage because it's only half cured. It's not fully cured. It's, uh, that's what we call as a pre-preg or a pre-impregnated stage. And therefore, there is a possibility of these fibers undergoing a small change. So in process modeling, what we try to do is to understand um, what kind of changes happen because of what kind of temperature cycles, what kind of pressure cycles. And then we work backwards so that uh, we start off with an angle which is not optimal. But we know that through the temperature and pressure cycles, it will change to nearly that optimal. Uh, so it's a just kind of working backwards to kind of a reverse engineering to understand uh, the process and then you try to uh, mimic that. So keeping that aside, uh, this is um, when you're trying to design any structure with a composite, this is something that you have to live with. and. Um, except for some special cases where you have the fiber and the matrix, in this case boron and aluminum, of similar kind of um, stiffnesses, which is why you see only about uh, two times is what you have over there. But in many cases, typical cases, you'll see around of the order of 10 is what you have uh, with respect to the two EL by ET. So, or even by E2. So that is uh, something that you have to live with, which means that um, you know it, there is certain dominant uh, loading direction as far as the design is concerned, but you should also be aware that there could be um, off-axis loads and you have to design for that as well. So one is because in the actual uh, uh, way in which the structure behaves itself, you could have the loads coming in multi-axial directions and um, some could be tension compression, some could be dominant uh, shear, etc. And uh, all of these could ha have be happening simultaneously also. 
Uh, and even in those rare cases where you know that the load is always um, uh, along the along a particular direction, you put a unidirectional composite along that, there can be certain off-design uh, situations uh, on the ground or during maintenance, etc. So you always try to ensure that the worst case scenario is taken not only for the longitudinal direction, but the worst case scenario is taken for the uh, uh, perpendicular direction as well, and then you design that. So you typically will rarely find a UD kind of a design you would have at least a few on the 90 degree. And um, uh, the fact that many of these prepregs are already available as fabrics which are woven means that you already are having the 0 and 90 degree uh, direction fibers. So uh, you would just have to place them in the appropriate way and you in different layers you place them in different directions. And typically when you have either pure torsion or uh, as the dominant load or uh, pure shear in plane shear as the dominant load, you would try to go for the plus, uh, so the same thing, instead of putting it at 0, 0, you will put it at plus minus 45 degrees and then you will take care. But if your prepreg is such that it is a UD uh, prepreg, then you have to make sure that one layer is like this, another la layer is like this, etc. And um, depending upon how uh, frequently you expect that off design load or during design itself, whether you expect the loads in multiple directions, you have to appropriately tailor the number of layers. If the number of total thickness of the zero degree layers and the 90 degree layers are equal to each other, then we call it a balanced cross ply. Otherwise, it's an unbalanced cross ply, uh, uh, but we know how to deal with it both in terms of analysis design as well as the actual behavior in the actual structure. So many cases you may not necessarily have a balanced layer yeah, because then you're um, working around uh, the uh, advantage that you have. The main reason why composites are so attractive is that you can tailor that and that tailoring uh, is possible only when you know the uh, dominant loading directions a priori. If you don't, then obviously you have to work for uh, uh, the probabilities in terms of what the load distributions could be and appropriately have uh, fibers in multiple directions. Yeah. Yeah, a good question. So because any laminate to start, um, the bonding between two layers is very good because otherwise delamination occur and that is uh, that can lead to many other kinds of damage so um, the prepreg being wet state it's already the fibers are engulfed in a matrix sleeve and that is the same in the other as well so the best possible is when you don't have a hybrid kind of a composite uh, and you see which means that you have the same fiber and matrix in all of the layers. so then you typically will have that fiber uh, the uh, matrix excess matrix that is there in itself will allow it to cure because when you're curing, you're first laying up all over uh, whatever laminate you want to have and then putting it into the autoclave. So just as each layer cures within itself, across the layer, uh, the interlaminar curing also happens and therefore it gets uh, bonded quite well. Um, even in case of hybrid composites where, for example, you have, let's say, glass fiber epoxy as well as uh, carbon fiber epoxy, you tend to use the same epoxy in both so that the uh, blending is pretty good. Um, uh, since you asked that uh, in the same context, uh, there's another interface. So not only this interface between layer to layer, but there's also an interface between the fiber and the matrix. That's also very, very critical. So what is typically done, for example, even when we say carbon fiber, it's actually, um, actually buy the carbon fiber from any of the uh, manufacturers, Excel, Torre, uh, Hercules, etc. a few uh, major companies which typically supply, you will see that um, if you actually uh, do a chemical test of that, um, the outer layer is not actually carbon, even in a carbon fiber. Uh, in other cases, it's very well known. Boron, for example, is always a carbon fiber with a, a boron coating or a silicon carbide also is carbon with a silicon carbide coating. Um, and uh, especially you want to put it in a metal matrix composite like titanium alloys, you would uh, do a pure titanium coating as well before you uh, put it into that so that the blending happens actually. So uh, in fact, uh, in the case of carbon, what is that coating is something which is proprietary to these companies. They will not re reveal that. It's, it's, uh, many people call it the secret sauce. So essentially, it's something that ensures that the bonding between the uh, 
epoxy and or any typical polymer uh, matrix that you put it in, uh, it will bond much better than just putting a pure carbon fiber. That is one reason. The other reason is also the kind of damages that would occur while handling and things like that are reduced because of that uh, coating that you uh, typically have. So, uh, so these interfaces are as, as important as the individual component uh, or materials. That is, you are as, as much as you are concerned uh, fiber strength, fiber stiffness, matrix strength, matrix stiffness in different directions, fiber along the length and matrix typically a perpendicular to that and also in terms of the compression uh, possibilities and the shear, etc. So in addition to that, you should also ensure that there is this compatibility. One, they should not chemically react with each other. The other is that, uh, the interface should be strong enough and that should not become the weak link in the chain. See, eventually when it fails, uh, typically it fails by one particular way and then it uh, goes on to other ways also. But um, a good design will ensure that e none of these failures are like too off from each other. So you, you try to work around such that these all these failures happen around uh, the same kind of total load. So that way you are not over designing any particular aspect of this. That, that may or may not happen all the time, but that is the intention of the designer uh, to, to the extent which is uh, permissible for the given choices that he, may, he or she makes. Come again? E 45 degrees? Uh, no, no. See, uh, what we are talking of is plotting is EX, right? So EX, whatever you are plotting, uh, as a um, ratio of ET. So we are not plotting versus at that particular value, right? So you would have a slight difference. So what you are plotting is um, at this uh, 45 degrees is E45 by E90, right? See, this is always E90. E2 is always E90. So maybe let me just. Uh, <coughs> So this is the structure, the specimen, let us say. So this is your x1. This is your x2. And uh, these are the fiber directions. So what we are plotting is this theta, which is what you see over here. This theta is the same. And um, so uh, this x1, uh, you can also call it as xl, the longitudinal direction. And this is xt, which is the, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So this is your XL direction, and this is your XT direction, right? So uh, what you're uh, plotting over here uh, is everything you're dividing by this uh, stiffness at the perpendicular direction to the fiber. So this is at 90 degrees to the uh, fiber over here. And so you, since uh, at 45 degrees, let's say if this theta is equal to 45 degrees, um, what will happen is that you, you are trying to uh, get this. Uh, this is what we are calling as EX. So this EX is along the X1 direction. So the stiffness, so if I apply a certain stress along this, let's say sigma 1, 1. And, um, sigma 1, 1 along this. Of course, there's no uh, <coughs> difference between the lines of action. So essentially, it's a point and a, throughout the uh, cross section. Now, if you are applying that and you're measuring your epsilon 1, 1 and you're plotting both and you're getting the um, stiffness, uh, the slope of that particular curve. So essentially, from that, you're trying to uh, plot this. The reason why it works that way is that there is a Poisson's effect that is happening over there. You're, you're, you can uh, put strain gauges both in this direction as well as in this direction. So using the data of both, you can get not only the, uh, the uh, Young's modulus, but also the Poisson's ratio. Right? So now uh, what we are trying to, uh, so this EX is nothing but your E along the one direction, which is your structural direction, not your um, uh, the principal material direction, which is not along XL, unless theta is equal to zero, except for this 
uh, particular case, right? So that is why you uh, were anticipating this to be uh, 1 over here, but it is not because we are not non dimensionalizing with respect to E45, but with respect to E90. The only place where it should exactly go to 1 is at uh, 90 degrees, because there both Ex and E2 are equal to your Et, which is along the transverse direction. But um, you see the fact that this is almost, uh, if you look this entire range, it is almost very close to the ET value in uh, all these cases when you are trying to look at it is close to unity, right? Yeah. Is it the only property contrast or any other physical reason for this form? Why it is falling? Why it is falling? Yeah. So, uh, see, essentially what you are having is this these are the principal material directions. So, along the uh, fiber direction, when you are applying the load, almost all the load is taken by the fiber and it is very stiff, right? Whereas when you are applying it along the 90 degree direction, there is a gap between fibers. So, fiber uh, by itself, uh, whether uh, if you do a test, which is very difficult, but there are ways in which you can uh, do tests of single fibers or a toe of fibers, where you can apply uh, compression is usually much more easy to do, but tension is much more difficult to do, it might have a reasonable stiffness. But what is the weak link over there is the matrix in between. See, when you are trying to pull it in this way, the essential stiffness is coming from the matrix in between. So, that is the dominant thing. And so, you know, the stiffness of the matrix is very, very low compared to the stiffness of the fiber along the uh, longitudinal direction, which is what uh, is uh, leading essentially to this. So, so this is this value is very close to the fiber modulus itself, uh, along with the vo volume fraction, whatever uh, of the fiber you are having, right? Whereas this is very close to the matrix value itself. The matrix, uh, and, and typically most matrices are isotropic, so it doesn't matter which direction you test uh, pure matrix uh, specimen. The whatever you get, you typically have uh, close to that. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. It depends on the boundary conditions that you have. So, what you are talking about is um, a unidirectional laminate where all the fibers are like this, and you are trying to apply uh, sigma 1 1, right? So, either you can fix this end or you can apply that sigma 1 1 there too. So, when you are trying to uh, stretch this, uh, what, what are you saying? Yeah. The fibers are in a 45 degree angle. Okay, something like this. Okay. So when I pull the fibers, they only have tension basically. So they probably will not have a transverse. No, see, you can always um, uh, break this, uh, transform this sigma 1 1 into a component along your XL direction and your component along XT direction, right? So uh, you have, of course, it is a little complica more complicated than a force transformation because it is a second order tensor compared to a force which is a vector first order transformation. But if you apply the appropriate rules for the uh, transformation, you will get a certain value along uh, XL and a certain value along XT. Okay? So then you will see that what is the um, load which is applied along these two directions and how it will be shared between the uh, fiber and the matrix. So, he, in this direction, whatever component of sigma 1 1 ha you have uh, will be mostly shared by the fiber and a small part by the matrix. In this direction, it will be mostly by the matrix. So, essentially, that is what is happening over there. Correct. So, it is possible. So, it is possible because when you are transforming this, um, uh, because uh, let us leave out 45 degrees, any arbitrary value of theta you take in general, uh, you if you are trying to let us say plot along this direction that is along the fiber direction where it is making an angle theta with respect to this, but the actual load is applied only along this. Then when you transform in general, you will have a, um, a stress in this direction. You could have a stress in this direction. It could be tension or compression in general. And you could also have a uh, shear which is coming out of that. 
So that's what your transformation will give you. They were all they will all be functions of the load that you are applying. Uh, let me put it in this direction also. They'll all be functions of the load that you are applying, as well as this angle theta. So in terms of that, you can uh, derive the values of, mm, uh, let's say, a sigma l, a sigma uh, or tau lt, and a uh, sigma t. So these would all these three would be uh, functions of your sigma 1 1 and your theta. Right? And in general, what you're saying is absolutely right, that uh, you could have a non-zero value for each one of them. OK, OK, sure. Sure, sure. So, uh, so let's take the uh, typical aerospace example. So first of all, you design the uh, composite on a theoretical uh, sense uh, using computational tools. And then you see that there's a particular optimum uh, layup uh, that you would like to have. So here we are just showing a single lamina. Instead, uh, in, in reality, what you would have is a fairly large number of layers. Uh, for typical large aircraft, this could go to as many as 80 or 100 uh, layers. Uh, it depends on the structure and the load, of course. So you have multiple layers. So then um, we call these, let's say, let's uh, introduce a mid plane drag it down okay so uh, you introduce a mid plane and um, this is let's say x2 direction and this is your x3 direction right so now based on the actual loads that are coming in the x2 direction x1 direction there could also be loads which are coming in the x3 direction, let's say a pressure distribution, a shear distribution, etc. So first of all, you arrive at the total number of layers that you want. We'll number it from the bottom 1 to capital N. And any N, any layer in between, a generic layer, we'll call it small n. Okay. So n is equal to 1 to n. So n, capital N could be of the order of 80, 100 in a large aircraft typically. It could be of the order of 5, 10, etc., depending upon the st particular structural component. Uh, how how much of kind of loads that are coming on it, right? Now, uh, based on your theoretical design and the actual kind of loads that are uh, occurring over there, you would have certain optimal values of the theta for each one of them, starting from theta 1 all the way to theta n in between and uh, theta capital N over here, right? Now you know these values of theta. So uh, you typically will take a unidirectional uh, fabric, uh, which is in the form of a prepreg. So it's a pre-impregnated structure in the sense that um, the supplier of the material has already put the fibers into a matrix, which is kind of wet. Okay, so it's neither. Uh, it's kind. Of, you can think of it as half cooked. So uh, essentially, what is happening is you are having something which is not fully cured. Neither it is can be considered as a raw material uh, in a typical sense. So what has happened is you have, uh, and that's the reason why this has to be uh, stored or kept in certain um, uh, with certain precautions in terms of the temperature range and the pressures that it can, uh, and also the dust uh, and uh, humidity uh, layers. So you have, it has to be protected from the dust and humidity typically, and there's a certain range of temperatures depending on the particular composite where you to keep it under certain uh, cold storage or whatever. So uh, when you are ready to uh, do this, you have done a theoretical analysis, you know that these are the layers that you want. And once this uh, uh, laminate shape is decided, uh, the actual structure uh, need not be a flat structure like this in a uh, skin. It could be, let's say, uh, an eye section beam that you want to design for the spar or whatever. So it could probably be um, put up as layers like this which are bent and then probably some more layers over like this so all that is part of the design how do you want to go about and there's no one unique way of doing it many many different ways of doing it but whatever you have decided this is still wet and you actually uh, put it into a mold or whatever to make this into a particular shape that you like let's keep that aside for now our interest is that this is laid up so one way of doing it is, uh, which is used to be almost a, a norm in the earlier days, is hand layup. 
So by hand, you're actually putting skill, skilled labor or putting these in the appropriate angles, uh, whatever is the, according to the design. And then you're, the entire thing will then be put into some kind of mold. And then it will be put into an oven. So this oven is what we call as an autoclave. And this autoclave uh, typically is a fairly expensive instrument, or uh, the prices have dropped over the years, but still uh, it's amongst the costlier uh, things. And especially when you're dealing with larger and larger aircraft, the structural components are much, much larger. So the la size of the autoclave that you want is also much larger. And because this is an oven that you want to maintain certain pressures and temperatures within that, you want to make sure that um, uh, the quality is uh, as good as possible, and therefore the, these are fairly expensive equipment. So using composites for more uh, low-end uh, applications, uh, let's say a typical consumer level uh, automobiles or uh, a few other applications, you would typically not go for this autoclave. There are other ways of doing it, okay? So this is uh, kind of been the almost the uh, main way in which uh, the aerospace composites have been made. So what you would do here is you would put this into a vacuum bag. So you would, uh, so you would, so here it's vacuum. So the uh, reason for that is that you do not want air or um, moisture, etc., to enter uh, into that and create voids because they, they can become sources of uh, damage uh, initiation and then the damage can grow. So what you typically do is you first vacuum it and then uh, this whole oven is subjected to certain uh, range of temperatures versus time, some kind of a history. You start with room temperature. You start at room temperature. You go to, oops, is this maybe? So you start with uh, the room temperature. You go to a certain high temperature, and then you essentially come. That's the simplest time cycle that you can have, uh, temperature cycle that you can have. Similarly, for the pressure also, you have a certain uh, starting with the atmospheric pressure, you go to a certain pressure and then come back. In reality, it could uh, have multiple cycles, not just one going to a maximum and coming down. It, could, it all depends upon the manufacturer's instructions and mostly depends upon the um, matrix material that you have. What is the level of curing that it is already there in the pre-preg? So you had pre-preg standing for a pre-impregnated uh, material, which is what we call as a pre-preg. So that pre-preg, we uh, have placed it in different uh, angles, orientations, um, next to each other, uh, making sure that there are no gaps in between when you lay them up. Uh, there are many automated techniques now, automated fiber placement, automated toe placement, etc., uh, which have come into vogue uh, almost on a regular basis now. So you don't need that hand layup in many situations. Um, so once that is done, uh, you vacuum it, you apply this uh, temperature pressure cycle, and then after a certain amount of time, you take it out. And when it's taken out, it's fully cooked now. So this was uh, half cooked uh, pre prep Now it's a fully cooked structural component, which, has, uh, which is now uh, solid. So here, it was very flexible. The pre-preg was very, very flexible. It's like a cloth, a fabric that you have. It will bend in any particular direction. So it's very easy for you to uh, put it into many shapes. Then you put it in a particular mold, and then you have, to, you have got that particular shape. And then uh, once it is cured, now it becomes uh, stiff. So it's no longer as flexible as it was with the pre-preg. And you have the actual structural component. Uh, laminate, yes. Uh, so essentially, prepregs which have been cured. Okay. So, so already, in fact, when you go, get to this stage, it's still in a pre-impregnated state. You have put all of them next to each other, and this is what you are talking about: the interface between them, how it gets cured, because it is also the same matrix. So, just like it gets cured within the layer, it gets cured across the layers also. Is there a interwoven or twill type arrangement Come again? Interwoven or twill Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I was discussing here was just a unidirectional prepreg. But um, what you're saying is absolutely right. That in many situations, you are not uh, sure of a particular direction along which a dominant load is there. You might have similar orders of magnitude loads on, in two different directions. Where the um, best candidate to go for is the fabric uh, 
because in the fabric you already have a 0 and 90 uh, built into it. And so then the process exactly is the same. So you just have those prepregs stacked up on one on each other. But in each layer, you know that it's not a single theta, but a theta, theta 1 plus a theta uh, 1 plus 90 degrees. So it's essentially each is having that particular uh, combination. So essentially, you're taking all of that into account. Yeah. So the modeling becomes a little more uh, complex, especially when you want more accurate results over here, because when you have a uh, fabric, uh, you are having these curves. The fiber is going around. The curvature is very large, but still, that has to be accounted for when you're doing. And as I said, twill and many different weave patterns are there. So you want to take that into account. And um, while we are at it, another way of strengthening this uh, interface is, uh, whereas most composites are 2D composites, uh, which is good for thin structures. When you go for thicker and thicker structures, delamination becomes a very, very serious problem. So you would have fibers along this direction as well. So what we call as 3D composites. So there we could have the uh, weaving patterns which are 3D weaving. So there are uh, weaving machines which can uh, do 3D weaving already. And you have much thicker uh, prepregs that you have, which, which have the fibers in the third direction. There are many other, way, other ways in which uh, this could be done, which is one is, for example, you put a pin through it, and then you bend that uh, pin. So you bend that pin uh, towards one direction. You bend it in the other direction this way. So what is called as Z pinning. So you essentially, you do something like that. There are many other techniques which are there. Uh, but what has been found in many situations for this three, we call these as 3D composites, as opposed to what I was talking of earlier as uh, 2D composites. So these 3D composites, um, typically, uh, you could have the locations where that is going through in a Z pin, for example. That hole uh, will essentially result in a possibility of a stress concentration or uh, source of damage initiation. So you have to be a little careful uh, in handling that. Um, another way um, uh, you try to strengthen this interface uh, is by going for better and better matrices. Once you know that it is a matrix dominated uh, strength the interface the one uh, one of the main ways in which you could improve it is by going for a different matrix so for example certain thermoplastics could perform better than the typical uh, epoxies that you have so you might want to uh, choose them uh, it also helps with the other uh, issue that we were talking about in terms of recycling etc Yeah, uh, so prepreg and lamina are same, just that the prepreg is in an uh, half cooked stage and your lamina is already cooked. So it's a, and the lamina is rarely found as a single layer. You will have uh, multiple laminae, which will uh, be called as a laminate. So your N layers that you have is what is called as a laminate. And these individual layers are your lamina. So when you have a plural for that, you call it a laminae. Uh, and those laminae stack together. And after curing, you are essentially calling it as a laminate. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the uh, prepreg that you have. Some prepregs are already matrix rich. So the uh, layers, when you actually put together, epoxy itself is actually uh, an adhesive by itself, Okay, the matrix. So it can cure by itself. But there could be certain uh, specific cases where you do not have a matrix-rich uh, region on the side, and then you would have to apply a separate uh, adhesive to do that. But again, that has to be compatible with the uh, whatever matrix that you have for the prepreg. This one? My, yeah. Uh, this will, uh, so no, what we are plotting here, yeah, it is for, for a, a certain uh, specific fiber volume fraction. So depending upon the, because it's the composite that we are talking about here, it has to be for a particular uh, value. So. So what will happen is as I increase the fiber volume fraction, let's take the carbon epoxy, for example. Uh, 
it will go like this. For a higher uh, fiber volume fraction, it will go over there. Because you're, uh, you're non-dimensionalizing with respect to ET. ET can also change. But because you're non-dimensionalizing with respect to ET, this remains 1. So then uh, your EL can increase because your fiber volume fraction has increased. So this flat region will keep on decreasing as increases fiber volume fraction. Uh, you mean it will be flatter for longer duration, uh, yeah, longer values? Volume fraction is less. Uh -huh. It should be more flatter because at a high, you will be having more matrix material. No, when you're increasing your fiber volume fraction, your matrix will come down, right? No. Yeah. Okay, for lower fiber volume fractions, you are saying that yes, you could have it uh, somewhere like this, right? So you are saying that it would be flat of, yeah, because this region, you know, not just at 90 degrees, but close to 90 is also matrix dominated. So this is matrix dominated region. And this region close to uh, 0 degrees is um, fabric dominated. So when you increase the um, uh, fiber volume fraction, this range would increase the way it be behaves there. And here it, uh, so in other words, the kind of steep fall that you had, for example, you may no longer have uh, when you go for higher and uh, higher fiber volume fractions. And so that, that's, a, um, that's a good uh, deduction that you have. Yes, that's true. It could have, because you know when something is dominated by a particular thing, you, uh, when you're changing it, uh, it will not be, um, it will remain similar to that for a longer time. So here also it remains similar to that for a longer time. So essentially you're saying that um, if I drop 10 degrees with the lower fi fiber volume fraction, um, the drop will be much more than if I have a larger fiber volume fraction, so for the same 10 degrees, the drop will be much lesser. So yeah, that's a deduction you can make. But these are all fairly straightforward uh, equations, uh, closed form analytical equations, which you can actually uh, find out and plot. So it's not uh, too much necessity to do this sensitivity analysis that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so essentially uh, when you are trying to do a uh, rule of mixtures, uh, so we will try look at those formula later on. So you are having the fibers uh, modulus times the fiber volume fraction plus the matrix modulus times the matrix uh, uh, volume fraction. Okay, so it's similar to any other uh, thing like density, etc., which have such a kind of a series kind of a dependence. So now, uh, when you have 60 degrees, your uh, uh, sine 60 is uh, root 3 by 2, cos 60 is half. So from that you're essentially uh, concluding that it would be uh, about half the uh, fiber volume fraction, right? So uh, now what we are saying is that we are not plotting the absolute values over here. We are non-dimensionalizing with respect to the uh, ET over there, right? So uh, that need not be exactly half over there. If I plot uh, just EF versus that, then uh, maybe you would have that particular uh, value of half that it would come to. It will not be exactly half again because there's also a matrix contribution that is coming, so which is very very small and negligible. So approximately, you can say that it it should come down to about half of the, what you are looking at. Yeah, yeah. But um, you should you have to be a little careful. Uh, let me let me not jump into this because um, uh, see uh, you have to make sure. Already I told you, uh, force you know how it will transform. Stress will transform even more complicated way. It involves co uh, cosine squared and sine squared. Force as a vector, it will involve cos thetas and sine thetas for the transformation. Your stress or strain, second order tensor, will involve cos squared thetas and sine squared thetas. Now what we are plotting is actually a fourth order tensor, which will involve cos power 4, sine power 4, etc. So it will be much more complicated than that. So let me take back uh, my answer for you. So it will not really go to half. It will be. Uh, it will depend on the uh, actual uh, 
uh, ratio of the fiber and the matrix properties, the volume fraction, and the uh, powers of the cosines and sines that are involved. Okay, so it will not just involve a cos four theta; it can involve a cos cube sine theta plus a cos uh, squared sine squared theta plus a cos sine cube theta and a sine power four theta. All these terms will uh, come into it, and each one of them will have different uh, uh, coefficients, uh, which in turn depend upon your uh, El Et for the fiber and the uh, E for the matrix isotropic. So all of those will contribute. So you cannot um, just say by looking at it uh, what will happen for a particular degree. But they're all uh, I was telling him uh, closed form analytical solutions. You can actually derive those and uh, you can plot them uh, quite easily. Yeah. So uh, see it's a very similar yeah. Yeah. No, no, it will not necessarily be longitudinal. So in, in your actual tire it could be in many different uh, directions. So you have your tire, not all fibers will be going in this particular direction. There will be a certain angle at which they will be going. There's a certain optimal angle. Depends on the kind of uh, uh, road situations, off-roading that uh, it is typically uh, experiencing, the kind of um, uh, terrain that it is typically designed for. Some mountainous terrain will have different angles of the theta, which are optimal. Certain um, you know, wet terrains will have different. Snow kind of terrains will have different. So depending on all those kinds of things, the actual angles are arrived at. And not all the all of them are at the same angle also. They, they are at just like what we were talking about over here. They are at different angles and uh, different l layers as you layer that up. Yeah. Anybody else? OK. So that's the uh, uh, the uh, issue was that it's ha it's having poor transverse properties and poor shear properties, and uh, how to make up for that is by going for a laminate design instead of a single unidirectional uh, laminar. So that's uh, one way of doing it. There may, it could be other ways, but but that's a major way in which you uh, account for strength and stiffness in the uh, non-longitudinal directions as well. So then, um, yeah, uh, that's exactly what I told just now. So the larger variation in properties uh, between lots. This is another issue with uh, composites. All, uh, we are looking at all these in spite of uh, things that over here. So the issue with that is, you know, even in a metallic uh, structure uh, for the same alloy, you could have, if you uh, make multiple specimen and test it, you'll have a little bit of scatter. So, and which in turn you can put it in terms of a, uh, let's say, probability density distribution function. Uh, the fact is that in the case of um, the uh, composite, that scatter will be a little more. So, in other words, if you um, uh, take the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean in that probability density distribution plot, you will find a larger standard deviation uh, per mean for uh, composites as compared to uh, metals. So, you should be aware of that, which means that. It's even more important to go for a non-deterministic analysis for composite structures than it is for a metallic structure. So, uh, as, and um, uh, these days it's quite, uh, very, quite kind of become common to use a Monte Carlo simulation, where, which is essentially uh, trying to randomly look within that probability density distribution that you have. Uh, take many cases, and you see for convergence, whatever properties uh, or um, uh, stresses or strains or displacements that you're eventually interested in, what kind of convergence uh, is reached over there. And based on that, you typically uh, take the appropriate value. So it's um, uh, with the kind of computational tools that we have today, that's, not, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do. That is one major reason what you are saying is absolutely right. In addition, you have multiple materials uh, at a, a much more macroscopic level. Uh, unlike in the alloys where you also have uh, multiple materials, but they are at a microscopic level. So the kind of interfaces that you have, the contribution of that, what kind of coatings you have, 
how much uh, the thickness of the coating, how uniform it is or not. And uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, but this, uh, the way you make the specimen um, is from a particular lot, right? So here, uh, in the case of the metal uh, or uh, any conventional material, usually you already have the material with you, and from that you're making the specimen. Here, in the case of the composite, you, what you have is not the material; you have the prepreg. In other words, it's not yet the material that is eventually goes in. It's a half-cooked material. So that cooking process, whatever it goes through in the autoclave, the temperature and pressure cycles, they can have a huge influence on how the uh, material performs eventually. So once you make that laminate, let's say a large laminate, and from that large laminate you're cutting out specimen, let's say, then there is a possibility of uh, the scatter coming down a bit. But Not, not necessarily, because uh, see, how much ever it is automated, there is still uh, the number of variables involved are so much more uh, that there is a possibility of small changes occurring. But, but um, in terms of what it used to be long back and what it is now, there are, it has come down drastically because the manufacturing processes have improved, not only because of automation, but also the other kinds of checks that they have in the overall uh, process, uh, the kind of control you have even in terms of the cycles that you apply, etc. cetera. Uh, another thing is how long the prepreg has been in your shelf. There's a certain shelf life that is associated with it. Uh, have you kept that in the appropriate manufacturer uh, defined uh, kind of conditions? Uh, most appropriately. Uh, any small changes in that can also result in small changes in how uh, it eventually behaves. So um, there's a certain aging process which is involved with the prepreg itself. So you have to make sure that um, that is not overly affecting your final product. But even after you take care of all those things, the number of variables involved in a metallic specimen uh, compared to the number of variables involved in a composite specimen, first of all, you have more materials. And then you're doing it in a stepwise process, the manufacturing. You're starting with a prepreg instead of starting with the actual raw material and uh, doing certain machining or some other uh, approach to arrive at the specimen. So, right? so uh, all that you have to uh, make sure. So the other thing is also in terms of uh, from a large composite, which is already cured, you're cutting out certain uh, ASTM standard specimens, let us say. The uh, process of machining can also affect the material properties over here. Because in the case of metals, you have a much larger uh, you have a yield and then a plastic regime. So the machining process does not change once uh, the machining is finished and it's been brought back to the room temperature, et cetera. The, te uh, the properties are uh, fairly easily, um, uh, you can uh, say that this is what it is. It will not, the scatter will not be too much. But in the case of the uh, composite, when you're doing the machining, especially polymer matrix composites, which is what we're talking about, you would have a possibility of that affecting the uh, overall behavior of the uh, material. So a specimen which has been machined in a particular way can have lead to different properties than so something which has been machined in a different way or uh, using uh, certain processes which are probably a little more damaged compared to uh, the recommended processes. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, we're done with uh, the major issues that uh, typically people face when designing with composites for a structure which has been conventionally been designed with metals, you have to replace that. These are the usual issues that you face. And um, uh, we have, as we have discussed, there are always ways to overcome many of them. Most It's difficult to say because it depends on so many factors. The specific uh, composite that we are looking at, also the manufacturing processes that it has gone through, the volume fractions, etc. But um, as a thumb rule, you can say that typically the scatter could be almost double what you have.
in the case of metals. But as I was telling him, uh, the, uh, with the improving manufacturing technologies that is coming down. So it's not something that uh, you need to be bothered about. And uh, there are ways to work around with your modeling techniques as well to account for that. And you make sure that even in the uh, worst case scenario, you still have a structure which is dependable, reliable. Yeah, so um, we already saw that the uh, main reason what we are using it is those three specific properties are much larger uh, in numerical value compared to the metals. So that is a given. Um, and those are the most uh, important things for a primary load bearing structure and therefore that, uh, that's quite uh, um, self-explanatory. The second important thing which is kind of overlooked many times is the flexibility that you have in the design because you have such a large variation in the properties going from uh, 0 degrees to 90 degrees that you can cater to the structure. So uh, unlike a metal where the metal is already designed by your material scientist and you're just using that metal, here you are designing the material also partially along with your structure because the eventual laminate that you have is not just what they gave you as a prepreg, right? So there is something that you're doing with that and you have a lot of control over it in terms of the different angles that you place, number of layers that you have, uh, the order in which they are uh, stacked up on each other. So there is so much of flexibility that you have in the design process and that I section I was showing you one particular way in which you could stack up. There could be many other ways in which you could stack up to get to the same uh, I section. So there is a flexibility, one, in terms of the number of layers, in terms of the angles, in terms of the stacking sequence, uh, then in terms of uh, how you come to the actual shaping of the structure uh, using the prepreg. And then also you have um, a lot of variables involved with the particular process that you're going to use. And let's say we choose the autoclave process, then the temperature pressure cycles that you want to uh, undertake, etc. So there's so much of uh, flexibility that you have in arriving at uh, the uh, final properties because these are not sigma u and e are not the only important structural properties like right? you have fracture toughness you have so many other uh, things the ductility what is the kind of elongation that you eventually it will go to etc so there is a certain level of play around that you can have with your uh, process and the way you design the structure so individually within a layer you have a certain level of elongation before it fails but once it is stacked in a particular way it is a part of a team and um, the individual strengths how they contribute to the team strength that is of the lamina to the laminate is quite uh, not uh, uh, some trivial thing that you have to look at so you have to explore all those possibilities and arrive at the most optimal design uh, that you have. So that flexibility is sometimes very, very helpful um, in coming up with a wing or let's say a fuselage, which is much more efficient compared to what you would with a uh, uh, metal. Essentially, you have many more variables to play around with uh, in your optimization process. So if you uh, just look at all of them and see which you have more control over in a particular process, you try to uh, take advantage of that in coming at the uh, uh, optimal or near optimal kind of a design. Then the third uh, advantage that you have moving from metals to composites is that uh, the kind of uh, fabrication facilities that you have uh, the, in terms of the initial material that you get. I, I was already talking about the prepreg, but that is only one uh, kind of thing. Especially in the automobile industry and various other industries, there are certain mold compounds which are used, what are known as uh, prepregs we already saw. And typically it's used with uh, more high performance composites where you need longer fibers. And when we say long fibers, we're not, uh, not necessarily thinking of meters or whatever. Even anything greater than 10 mm is considered to be uh, long enough because the uh, diameters of these are of the order of 7 microns, 10 microns, etc. So compared to that, the length of 10 mm is actually fairly long. And so uh, I was also talking to you about in an earlier class in terms of the stress diffusion process where among several fibers, one of them gets cut off, uh, how quickly the stress transfer can take place through the matrix. Um, offering its sheer resistance and um, very, very, very small portion of the fiber which is cut 
uh, is not actually performing. The rest of the fiber, even of that cut fiber, is also performing uh, fairly well. So uh, keeping that in mind, um, so typically you have uh, pre pricks Of course, in filament winding machines, etc., you have a meter long or many, many meters long uh, kind of fibers, etc. So it's not that. Just in terms of the kind of performance, this is a uh, reasonable uh, thing that we are looking at because uh, mm is uh, 10 power 3 microns you're looking at 10 power 4 microns uh, as opposed to let's say 10 microns so almost a thousand already you have as a factor over here when you're looking at a typical 1d model for example even a factor of 1 by 10 you, you get a pretty good beam here you're talking of a factor of 1 by thousand so you get uh, pretty reasonable things but there are situations where you go for even smaller uh, kind of fibers, typically chopped fibers, etc., for uh, more um, economical applica applications where cost is a, uh, one of the major driving factors, uh, priority is much higher for the cost. And then you have what are known as SMCs, the sheet molding compounds, where you typically have, again, almost same uh, of, in terms of orders of magnitude. Uh, so you're talking of one inch fibers typically, but the way they are made is quite different. So in a sheet molding compound, uh, what you typically have is unlike in a uh, pre-preg where you have with, within each layer already the fiber and the matrix, in a sheet molding compound what you have is uh, typically a resin. Uh, that resin is um, uh, sent out through a certain um, uh, uh, line pore that come, it co flows through that and as it flows through that it gets solidified and as it solidifies there is a thin layer of a sheet which comes out. On, and there is a, uh, on the top you typically have um, a fiber shredding machine which shreds and drops the fibers randomly on top of that sheet which is still wet. Uh, and then you, there's one more sheet which comes on top of that. So essentially it's a sandwich between uh, two sheets uh, which are of lower uh, stiffness and you have the thicker, uh, um, uh, sorry, the better performing fibers in between them. So it's exactly opposite of uh, what we typically talked about in a sandwich structure where we had in a larger sandwich structure, we had face sheets which are made out of composites or metals which are much stiff and comb or comb in between which is very less stiff. That is the uh, typical sandwich. In a sheet molding compound, it's exactly opposite that these sheets are essentially matrix rich, your resin. In fact, uh, there's no fiber in it, it's pure matrix. And this is uh, engulfing the um, fibers in between them. Now, you might question that typically uh, in a structure, you know that whether it is bending or torsion, we already saw the stresses are more in the outermost and the stresses are least in the in uh, in between so what's the point in having a less stiff uh, material on the outboard and uh, more stiff material in the inboard can anybody answer that that made a lot of sense the sandwich structure because your face sheets are going to take your uh, tension and compression in a bending and it's going to take the maximum uh, shear stress in a torsion. So you wanted that to be outboard and the inboard it was mainly taking the transfer shear and the foam or honeycomb is good enough at taking that. So uh, that was the right thing to do and typically those stresses are much smaller. But here you're having the, uh, the sheets on the top and the bottom very very low in stiffness, low in strength and in between you have these chopped fibers which are fairly strong. So uh, what is the logic behind that? Yeah. It's a good point because uh, you want it to uh, be shaped uh, much more easily in, and more complicated shapes can be done. Um, which is one of the advantages you get with the SMC, but you could do that with a prepreg also. So it's not something because prepreg is uh, pretty much as flexible as uh, these are. The compression, the compression, ah. total compression, uh -huh. uh, because matrix is better at compression. You are saying, yeah. Yes, true, uh, but there's something, uh, th those are higher order effects, what you're saying. Uh, 
but uh, there's a much more uh, important reason why uh, it, it's, it's a good enough design in spite of having s less stiff, less strong materials on the outboard. Exactly. So see, eventually what you're looking at is not that particular lamina taking the entire bending or taking the entire uh, that sheet, whatever you're forming by two layers of matrix and the chopped fibers in between, that is not going to be subjected to your bending. So once again, you're going to go just like with you started with pre -preg, you're going to stack them up uh, multiple uh, thing here the uh, angle doesn't matter because already it's a randomly distributed chopped fiber so you're going to have multiple layers so you have the eventual thing that you're going to have structure that you're going to have is much thicker or even if it's thin it's a, let's say an I section beam you have one SMC laminate on the top uh, for the top flange and another for the bottom flange so one of them is going to take only tension the other is going to take only compression so essentially what you're having is um, uh, uh, the the uh, geometry that is involved, the thicknesses that are involved for each of these SMCs is not the overall thickness of the structure that you're going to have. You're going to have stack up just like what you did with the preplex. You're going to stack up many of them. So eventually it doesn't matter because you're going to have fibers close to the uh, ends as well. The chopped fibers are going to be, there's going to be a thin layer of matrix, but that was there even in the case of the prepreg because the outer layers are typically mostly uh, matrix rich. So. Uh, but that layer is so thin compared to the kind of uh, um, overall structural element, let's say an I section or uh, even a stringer for that matter, what you're having is, is fairly small. So therefore, it's capable of handling that. But the advantage of this is uh, you do not have that uh, storage facility that you need for this to keep it at a certain thing. Uh, you already have, yes, for the uh, resin itself, you have certain shelf life and certain requirements uh, which are not as complicated as for the prepreg in terms of the restrictions are much more for the prepreg because it's not only that resin, but it's also a half cooked kind of a resin. Whereas here you have the actual resin itself and that's what you're uh, trying to use in the manufacturing process. So this is something which is almost used on a regular basis in automobile industry. So the short fiber composite uh, is easy to make it uh, in terms of the fiber availability as well as in terms of uh, the fiber manufacture itself and then putting it together. But once you uh, have short fibers, orienting all of them in a particular direction becomes difficult. See, one of the major advantages we had of um, going for composites is that we know a priori the dominant loading direction. We want to put the fibers in that direction. So in this case, you're putting the fibers in random direction. So it's almost like an isotropic material that you're uh, ending up with. Uh, it will have, uh, compared to uh, the uh, other, let's say, metals, etc., it might have still superior properties over here, but it will have that in all directions, and the ratio may not be the, I I the increase in each one of them compared to metals may not be as much as uh, when you're doing with prepreg with an appropriate kind of a design that uh, uh, of the laminate, etc. So that is the reason. Okay. So uh, see again, um, good that you brought that up because one of the strongest um, you know, fiber-like materials what we have is the carbon nanotube, the CNT, uh, which is typically a graphene, which is um, uh, worked around itself and joined in a particular way. So uh, the way it is manufactured, the way it has undergone a lot of um, evolution in the last 30 years that it's been around with us. But the uh, CNT is very, very strong along the um, tube axis, the uh, carbon nanotubes axis. But um, when you make a structure out of it, getting all the CNTs to orient in a particular direction is very, very difficult, very, very challenging. Uh, and also in terms of the equal, equal distribution in a uh, geometric sense also in terms of the volumetric distributions also, it's a difficult. So both directional and volumetric distributions are the challenges that you have. But in spite of that, CNTs can probably increase your uh, strength quite a bit. And in between these two, you know, what we are talking of chopped fibers at one extreme, uh, we are to, which is of the order of one inch or so. Then we are talking of um, CNTs at the other extreme in terms of what is the maximum length of a CNT you can typically grow. Um, of course, technology has improved over the years, but still uh, we are not nowhere close to getting the kind of lengths that we uh, typically want. In between these two, we have what are known as whiskers. Uh, 
So whiskers is another name used for uh, mustache as well. But in this particular context, the whisker refers to the minimum diameter that you can go to for a particular material in uh, drawing it into a fiber. So that minimum diameter that you can draw without uh, affecting it, that has huge superior properties compared to any other fiber of that material. But the problem with that is, again, you can make very long fibers with that, and which means that you typically, when you use them, you might have to put it in a random distribution, and therefore the properties are pretty much the same in all directions. You don't get this flexibility, and the uh, kind of increase that you have in this is not um, to the total potential of those materials. Uh, yes, see, individually the uh, whiskers are very high performance, but the fact that their lengths are so small means that um, the way they get used in a structure, their performance is not is going to come down drastically because of the random orientations. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Uh, I'll just save the answer for a little later because I have a certain little exercise that I want to do with the class as part of something. Then, um, uh, so if I answer that, I'll give away the answer for that. So. Once I answer that, I'll come back to the length dependence over there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So is it like long fibers only or like short fibers? So it is, it is pretty much like long fibers, but it's kind of of the same order of magnitude that we're talking about over here. But um, you see, one inch is what, uh, two and a half centimeters, so about 25. Uh, mm that you're looking at. Here you're saying even 10 mm is considered long fiber. So it's it's pretty much like long fibers only, just that they're not oriented in a particular direction. Whereas in a pre-preg, it's either a UD or it's a fabric uh, which is pre-impregnated. So you know the direction for a fairly long. So uh, this is kind of the minimum that is required. But typical application your prepreg will have much much longer fibers so it's not that this is the typical uh, length of fibers in a prepreg they are they, they, they are much longer in reality but from a um, point of view of their performance as long as you have ensured that they are in a particular direction the orientation is taken care of even if they get cut off in between let's say i make a prepreg and uh, due to some reason at certain locations the fibers get cut not all at the same location but at different locations, they get cut, and they're of the order of 10 mm each. They would still perform as good as uh, your long fibers. Um, there will be a small drop, but uh, it's, it's negligible it, because of the fact that the matrix is able to transfer the stresses between the fibers quite well. No, yeah, so just, you just like here I was talking of the minimum, this is like a typical value. You could have uh, larger or smaller than that. So you're just saying the typical orders of magnitude of these. So you could have either smaller or longer than that, yeah. But essentially, more important thing is uh, the distribution is random because of which you're not taking all the advantages that it uh, typically offers. But the uh, manufacturing is much simpler rather than uh, the typical uh, processes that we have to go through with the pre-preg. Yeah. So that's um, one, two types we have looked at in terms of the availability of materials. We'll look at the third type and uh, before we end the class. The other is the bulk molding compound. So uh, sheet molding, uh, as the name itself suggests, it's uh, in the form of sheets. So two sheets of matrix rich layers, and in between you have this chopped fibers. Now the bulk molding is just like uh, your dough, like uh, to make your chapati or you have the atta dough that you have. You already have it mixed with a certain matrix, uh, which is semi-solid, and uh, the fibers, the chopped fibers uh, in that. So you just try to, uh, just like how you do the atta, you are essentially making thin layers out of that. Or you could put it into a molding, because essentially these are compounds uh, meant for molding. So in an actual structure, what you would do is 
um, you would put uh, these layer, uh, these uh, um, dough-like stuff, and then you would uh, put it into a particular mold and then subject it to a certain uh, temperature pressure cycle, not as complex as the uh, autoclave process, but much, much simpler than that. It could just be, uh, let's say, uh, you have a metallic mold in which you put this material and then you uh, apply a certain pressure with a, a, a typical like a UTM kind of a machine with a compressive load instead. And then you apply a certain heat through the, um, let's say there is a coil uh, in that metallic block of the mold and then you apply a certain uh, electric uh, current through that to heat it up and then it heats and then it gets uh, baked. So something like that. So it's much less expensive compared to even the sheet molding compound. So we are go going from prepreg down to bulk through sheet SMC uh, to BMC. We are essentially looking at more and more um, inexpensive uh, kind of solutions for those applications where cost is much, much more demanding. Okay, so there you typically have uh, even shorter fibers than what we were talking about earlier. And um, yeah, so probably, yeah, I think that we could go through this. The, the thermal expansion coefficients for uh, typical composites, so it, and whenever I say composites, I'm uh, referring to polymer matrix composites. Um, there are situations where we'll look at advantages with respect to the other MMCs, CMCs, et cetera. There we, I'll specifically mention that. So the, uh, the fact that you have the um, matrix, which is either a thermoset or a thermoplastic uh, matrix, they uh, have a very low coefficients of expansion. In particular, the thermoset matrices, which have been the most uh, used so far, like epoxy is an example of a thermoset matrix. They, you know, once it is set, you do not have, even with uh, the kind of range of temperatures that are typical in applications, you will not have very large expansions that are there. Much, much lower, al you typically use the notation alpha uh, in terms of mm per degree centigrade to refer to how much of expansion will happen for a degree centigrade rise in temperature. So that alpha, if you compare for uh, typical polymer matrix composites, much lower compared to what it is for metals uh, and uh, many other situations as well. So so uh, that, that is one advantage. The other thing is that uh, the fiber itself, what goes into that, let's say uh, carbon, has a very high uh, alpha that it could have. But uh, the fact that now you're putting this into a matrix, and the matrix is the outer layer, it's also an insulator. So now it's not going to transmit that temperature change so quickly into the uh, fibers that are there. So even if the fiber has a large alpha, you typically don't have an issue with uh, very large expansions happening because of uh, temperature changes. On the other hand, what we saw earlier uh, in the previous class, in spite of uh, where we talked about moisture pickup. So, so usually these two are considered together in what we call as hygrothermal stresses. Hygro standing for the, high, the uh, humidity levels going up or down, any change in the humidity levels, and thermal is essentially your temperature changes. So just like you have an alpha coefficient associated with the uh, thermal, you have a beta coefficient which is associated with any change in the humidity that you have in, a, in terms of certain percentage. So when you have that kind of uh, uh, change, there the humidity can affect it much more than the uh, temperature in typical uh, carbon epoxy composites, let us say, where, uh, as we talked about there, uh, there is a possibility of um, the moisture getting picked up, some little bit of swelling, and more uh, uh, worse, the fact that uh, the properties can be degraded quite a bit after that uh, moisture absorption has taken place, whereas um, this is an advantage. So uh, though these are typically studied in a, uh, in a common modeling paradigm, hydrothermal stresses, uh, in terms of advantages and disadvantages for, in particular for polymer matrix composites, it's quite opposite in terms of their behavior. So I think with this, uh, we'll uh, continue for the, with the other advantages in the next class. Thank you. That's correct. That's correct. That, that's an important point that you brought out. But the fact that, um, you see, the, uh, if the um, temperature was being applied to the fiber and the fiber had expanded quite a bit, then uh, 
there is and the matrix is not expanding there is a problem now the fact that the matrix is insulating it is protecting the uh, fiber from uh, experiencing that temperature change in the first place so um, you know, it, it, it's not very easy for that change in temperature to reach the fiber so that fact means that uh, at the interface still there is not too much of a stress developing there will be a small amount no no doubt about it but it's not something to be uh, concerned about if it was the other way around then yes that problem would have been there so that uh, matching is very very important glad you brought that point up because it's not just about uh, alpha matching there is also the stiffness matching there's a huge difference in the stiffness between that so that coating and the interface is always subjected to that in spite of that it should still be able to handle that and that's the case uh, uh, across the uh, laminate also between the interfaces uh, between the lamina which we call as the interlaminar shear and or interlaminar normal stresses all of that get affected by the fact that two adjacent layers may not have the same stiffness in the same direction because of which there could be certain stresses which are developing out of them but these are all uh, things that are uh, and not so large to be worried about in a normal design because the matrix strength is capable of handling those kinds of um, interfacial st uh, stresses coming because of uh, these differences between layers or between fiber and matrix Correct, uh, valid point, but the very fact that these materials, we will see the range of temperatures in the next class, thermosets are first of all not capable of handling very large temperatures. So the typical operational temperatures will be much, much lower. So and many of these applications are uh, in regions where there is not too much of a temperature change. Of course, it's um, flying at higher altitudes, it's exposed to very low temperatures there. That's not too much of a concern. It's only if it increases beyond the room temperature, let's say 200 degrees, 300 degrees, then you have uh, major issues uh, coming out of that. So the, uh, at, at the lower end of the spectrum, this is actually a huge advantage that you have, that the thermal coefficient uh, uh, of expansion is much lower for these materials, that even when there is from the room temperature uh, at the uh, sea level to, uh, let's say, about 12 kilometers altitude or whatever, whatever is that drop is not going to change your dimensions uh, uh, too much. So when you have higher temperature applications, there are other matrices that you need to go to, which is what we'll look at in the next class. A composite propellant tank with? Huh? Yeah, okay, yeah, right, 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 okay. Right, right, right. It is, yeah. See, more of an issue than that uh, the, is the fact that uh, at lower temperatures, the brittle nature becomes even more. So the fact that it can break because of that is at a much lower strain than what it would at, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say, at the room temperature. So, so th there are issues associated with that. But even there, again, what we are talking about is still the outer layers are going to be matrix rich compared to the uh, inner layers. So it all depends upon the kind of volume fractions of the carbon fiber that you're going to have, et cetera, and the surface finishes that you're going to do. So uh, in most such situations, you will have certain uh, where the uh, temperature ranges to be experienced are very large. You, will, you may not allow just that uh, basic primary structure to experience it. There will be a certain, if not uh, tiles, uh, which can be very heavy. It, it would typically be, let's say, a coating or something like that. Um, which, uh, which many of those coatings are kind of transparent. So you might still see that black structure, you might think it is primarily carbon. Uh, so just like even an in individual carbon fiber, there is already a coating on that. 
and um, uh, but those coatings are typically transparent so you see a black uh, carbon fiber uh, you can still see that but um, yes uh, so there are issues but there are workarounds and also you have to look at the appropriate uh, application uh, what kind of fiber matrix what kind of coating all of these become part of that uh, design process and uh, there i think the more of the issue was in terms of the size of that it was one of the biggest uh, pressure vessels probably produced uh, with uh, carbon epoxy kind of a composite so uh, it it was a huge challenge because uh, the kind of uh, autoclaves which are necessary to cure that um, even large companies like say boeing or even airbus let's say makes a380 much larger or the beluga and for those the kind of composites that they have the kind of curing that they have the autoclaves etc you cannot uh, do many parts which you could have integrally manufactured only because you don't have a, such a large autoclave so uh, so it was quite surprising because um, uh, elon musk didn't reveal all the details of how that spacex uh, uh, pressure vessel was actually made and uh, eventually it burst you typically see that the bust was at uh, the seam in between uh, so it it appears that um, we, we are only guessing but uh, it could have happened because uh, these two were made separately in two in, in an autoclave because the maximum size of the autoclave was that much and they were joined in a particular way and that joint probably became the uh, weak link in spite of all the additional stiffening that they might have had for that and uh, eventually it led, led to the burst but uh, yes so there are challenges but there are work arounds also yeah. a good you brought that point up yeah anybody else okay thank you